I now return to and continue my series looking at the planet types, conditions and installations of the Imperium of Man. The Imperium encompasses so many worlds that it's believed they are far from all accounted for. It is considered the Imperium currently constitutes over one million worlds. The Adeptus Terra holds that the whole human race is under the exclusive rule of the Emperor of Man, and as such one of the ongoing quests carried out by the Imperium remains to locate and unite lost human colonies, just as it did during the Crusades. While the Imperium of Man wields immense power through its military forces, a common misunderstanding is to assume that all its worlds are well defended, and any incursion will result in an apocalyptic defensive struggle. This is not the case at all. The size of the Imperium and its territory means that it cannot react to every circumstance. Sometimes it may not even receive distress communications until after the fact, by which point arriving relief ships will discover a long since ravaged colony or the aftermath of a terrible industrial disaster, leaving little to do other than take note and return home. Some events may even take centuries to be relayed to terror. This makes the ongoing management and organisation of the Imperial Territory understandably challenging. The borders of the Imperium are currently moving with new worlds conquered and colonised while others are quietly or violently lost. Within this flux of territory exists planets designated as the War Planets. Unlike the more calm and civilised planets in our previous overview, the War Planets generally speaking would be considered a nightmare to live in. Even the Forge, Armoury or Fortress worlds are not going to be generally somewhere you'd want to be, and the less said about the Hive and War actual worlds, the better. A Forge world is a planet designated to the production of Imperial military resources. They are under the direction and control by the Adeptus Mechanicus, and this is the official Imperial title for the Cult Mechanicus or Cult of the Machine. This was the group who, with which the Emperor would forge his unique alliance in the early formation of the Imperium, and who stands with distinct separated rights and self-regulation given to them by the Emperor in return for their support with their vast stockpile of assets during the early days of the Imperium. They serve under the Treaty of Mars instead of the Imperial Creed, and this allows them to follow their own path and teachings, including the worship of the mysterious deity they call the Machine God, or the Omnissiah. They regard organic substances as weak and perceive the replacement of the organic with bionic mechanical elements as sacred. Many of the old tech priests on Mars are more machine than man, and the Imperium's strict rulings regarding AI are potentially bent by the Mechanicus out of the sight of Imperial rulers. Mars was the very first forge world of the Imperium, and here the Mechanicus are the sole rulers, but across many forge worlds they remain sole rulers. They and their forge worlds across the Imperium provide heavy support and armament for Imperial forces, and Mechanicus itself wields massive armies of titans, as well as their own force known as the Skitari. Forge worlds provide hardware not only purely military based, but also agricultural equipment, terraforming apparatus, basically anything infrastructure related. The Mechanicus are obliged, as described in their ancient treaties with the Emperor, to provide whatever the Adaptus Terra require. Forge worlds are in essence immense factory installations, both above and below ground. They may also constitute mining operations on the planet itself. This is often why a planet was originally set up as a forge world. They also contain training and research facilities, even religious structures for the Mechanicus. Forge worlds are heavily defended and unlikely to fall to anything other than an exceptionally heavy, ferocious and well-planned attack. The Mechanicus's cybernetically enhanced Skatari warriors defend them, backed up by Titan legions on all Forge worlds, making them an incredibly foolish target to assault for any Imperial enemies. The Adeptus Mechanicus generally do not allow non-Mechanicus personnel onto Forge worlds, only tech priests, Skatari, and the sad drone labour force known as Servitors. Servitors are mindless cybernetic drones created by fusing humans with machine parts. They're usually lobotomized also in the process. Now, servitor bodies can be vat grown, or more disturbingly, they could be criminals who have been judged and sentenced to repay their crimes to society by mindless slave labor in the form of a servitor. Once their minds are turned to mush, the painful operations of installing bionic machine elements to their bodies will be completed. Even heretics are given a chance to serve the Imperium after they have been judged, the lucky things. 
Surprisingly, even some Space Marine recruits can be converted to the Servitor role, but would only serve their chapter as a more respectful and honorary Servitor role. The Mechanicus, though, also wield the most feared Servitor class, the Praetorian Servitors, a class of heavily armed Servitor used by the Mechanicus in guarding tech priests and their temples to the Machine God. A Forge world will usually have no ecosystem to speak of, this will have long since been completely destroyed, deemed unnecessary and often overwhelmed by the scale of industry. As such, Forge worlds are usually desolate and lifeless other than the factory and defensive installations sprawling across their surface. Pollution both in the air and land will be at saturation levels, and surface bodies of water will usually be deliberately evaporated away to make room for further production sites. All hardware produced across Forge Worlds is replicated with an existing pattern. This enables Forge Worlds to ensure standardization across its production. Obviously, a really important necessity for any hardware that's going to be deployed, repaired, and interchanged across vast armies and territory. Hence, why you see some Imperial assets with names like the Mars Pattern Warhound Titan. Notable Forge Worlds across the Imperium are Mars, the homeworld of the Adeptus Mechanicus, the Imperium's first Forge World. Riser, which is said to be second only to Mars, once famous for its plasma weapon production, it was renowned for manufacturing plasma reactors and magnetic containment tech. It also was the first to produce the Stormblade super heavy tank used by Imperial Guard. Riser currently though now faces an ongoing battle of survival against a ferocious orc warg, numbering in the hundreds of millions of deployed orcs on the planet. This ongoing battle of attrition is far from won. Agrippina was a primary supplier of military stock to the fortress world of Cadia. It's also known as the Orb of a Million Scars. At present it stands in ruin due to the ongoing assault by Chaos forces. While it still stands, it faces eventual defeat with little agriculture worlds able to survive and support it. Trebor served exclusively Cadia. Its most renowned production was the Vanquisher cannon, which was a more complex version of the Imperial Battle Cannon used on Imperial Guard tanks like the Lehman Russ. The most powerful of all these variants. It was colonized by citizens from Terra and Mars, and as such became one of the most technologically advanced of all Forge Worlds. It was rediscovered by Commissar Yarrick during the Second War for Armageddon, and as such would swear allegiance to him. Phaeton is home to the Legio Osadax, a little known about Titan Legion likely founded during the Great Crusade. It also was the Forge World noted as the originator of the common pattern Lehman Rust tank, a heavily utilized Imperial Guard piece of hardware. Phaeton also managed to produce in the 38th millennium a variant hull of Space Marine Land Raider. Outwardly its appearance was the same as a normal Land Raider, but internally it had a very different and higher spec. Investigations by Mechanicus determined that the automated factories were operating under a deep core protocol that had taken millennia to cycle through. No tech priest had ever witnessed this before, and it was also determined that at the dawn of the Imperium, a Magi had coded a slow-burning algorithm into the Forge's automation sequences so that it would produce variants of common patterns according to his cognitive calculations to what he would perceive the Imperium was going to require. Phaeton as a Forge World would go on to produce more variants of Space Marine hardware, and as such a subcult of Mechanicus has formed around the Forges of Phaeton. They devote maintenance and reverence to its facilities, and some wish to enshrine and worship its new productions. But others believe these holy machines should be released into service to achieve their true potential. This cult potentially poses a dangerous risk of a split within the tech priests on Phaeton and a potentially destabilizing situation of production from this forge world. Armory worlds are utilized by the Adeptus Munitorum. This is a subdivision of the Adeptus Administratum and is designated to general administration. Personnel assignments, supply, logistics of the Imperial Guard, that kind of thing. The Minotaurum have the responsibility of raising Imperial Guard regiments, training troops, providing equipment and supplies out in the field, as well as transportation of troops using ships from the Imperial Navy. It's primarily a logistical segment of the Imperium. Armory worlds will be understandably heavily defended as they store weapons, vehicles, ammunition and other military hardware required by the Imperium. They will likely have stockpiled armoured vehicles in the tens of thousands and millions of tons of munitions and other necessary resources for supporting and resupply. 
Its storage facilities are housed usually underground behind immense heavy duty blast doors. Its internal climate maintained to ensure equipment can be kept for hundreds, even thousands of years until the Imperium requires it. Some armory worlds end up storing equipment for such extended periods of time that the Mechanicus or Guard forces actually lose the knowledge on how to use it, such as the comically dystopian dark nature of the Imperium. An example of something like this would be the Valdor Tank Hunter. It was developed during the Horus Heresy as a weapon to help counter the land raiders of the traitor Space Marine Legions, and it is equipped with a neutron laser projector, a weapon capable of destroying its targets at a molecular level. This weapon was actually developed during the Dark Age of Technology, so subsequently very few Forge Worlds are able to actually replicate or even maintain them. It's now considered an ancient relic in the 41st millennium, as they are no longer able to be constructed. However, Dark Mechanicus forces are known to have captured some during the Heresy, leading to a concerning prospect that Chaos forces might actually be able to discover how to replicate them in the future. Hive worlds are one of the most well-known planet types in the Imperium. These accounted worlds number somewhere over 30,000 in the current Imperium territory. The populations are so immense that they live in gargantuan arcologies known as hive cities. To give you an idea of the size of a hive world, it is said in the Imperium that the sacrifice of one million Imperial soldiers is worth about one day's worth of a hive world's production. So a warm reminder of just how unimportant you are as a citizen of the Imperium, your life is not going to be missed. The outside terrain and ecosystem of a hive world is usually destroyed, as such they represent depressing images for a planet, ruined worlds where people usually sustain a living in just these vast settlements towering into the skies. The planets themselves probably began as viable, even lush, but over time through pollution, irradiation, they are ashen wastes or deserts through unending industrialization. So it falls to the hives to be entirely self-contained, housing tens of billions of citizens. This population will potentially double every century, with a hive generally containing anywhere between 10 to 100 billion people. Each hive world could contain anything from just 3 to 5 up to as many as 20 hive cities. They do also contain manufacturum which produce vast stockpiles of war material and other goods for trade and supply within the Imperial Tithe or Tithe Grade. This of course is the requirement a world must supply to the Imperium. The size of this tithe will depend on the type of world to which it's applied, and this could be food, weapons, minerals, even people. Whatever the Imperium requires they supply, then they must meet that demand by any means necessary. The logistics of this, given the scale and time differences across such vast distances, makes it often a confusing and difficult process to properly manage. Astartes or Space Marine worlds are usually exempt from tithes and given a grade of aptus non. But if you thought the outside of a hive world was dangerous, then the inside is hardly an escape. Poverty stricken, crime running through them like a plague, and almost always polluted, and that's before you get to the underhive. The lower levels of a hive usually contain mini war zones controlled by violent gangs, the most notable of this type being the hive world of Necromunda which incidentally the Imperial Fist chapter actually recruits from. The lower portions of the Necromunda Hive are rife with gang warfare and ruthless bounty hunters. Lower levels of hives often also are the refuges of mutants and heretical cults who hide from authorities there. Assassins could also hide here to escape the gazes of these authorities. The scale of citizenship within a hive though is difficult to believe, and each of those citizens is a potential soldier for the Imperium of Man. While their ability to produce munitions and other resources is important, their biggest production capability is simply manpower. This resource can be used for recruitment by the Imperial Guard, colonization of new planets, or any number of probably much more unpleasant tasks. While the workers in a hive might live in nightmarish conditions of industrial production and street violence, it will be no surprise that the higher classes actually live in upper areas of the hive with relatively affluent surroundings. For those higher class citizens, facilities may even include gardens and most importantly clean air, food and water. A few worlds in the Imperium have even gone beyond hive structure to create super hive worlds, the most notable being Terra itself. Where the planet once known as Earth is now, what replaces it is an ecumenopolis, that is a planet-wide 
city that would also stretch deep underground. Near solely dependent on imports from agri-worlds for its food supply, they represent an impressive but simultaneously precarious state of industrialization and development. Now an easier to define planet, these are planets the Imperium classify as war zones, and as the famous 40k tagline states, in the grim darkness of the 41st millennium, there is only war. The Imperium is constantly battling for control of various important planets and territories. While some are saved, others burn or are abandoned, the inhabitants condemned to undoubtedly horrific fates. They may be ruined by orbital bombardment spanning many years to a point where it's even questionable the purpose of such assaults. The Imperium might wield massive armies that are going to grind their way across a planet's surface over extended periods of time in vast wars of attrition. These hellish deployments make up the main focus of Imperial Guard's service and it's not something that you would wish for. Mercenaries may also appear to engage in small but dangerous missions hoping to leave alive and with payment. Often this kind of experience for an Imperial Guardsman leads to unsurprisingly deserters of the Imperial Guard, and escaped prisoners form bands of pirates seeking a way off of a war planet, knowing that literal lobotomization and servitude awaits them otherwise. Execution in many cases would probably be preferable, so they're extremely dangerous to anyone who encounters them. Some of these groups are humans turned feral, losing their minds and being completely broken by the unimaginably nightmarish experiences they have had. If they do manage to escape the planet now, unable to then return home to Imperial Worlds, they'll form a pirate's life of scavenging and assaulting transport ships. Bounty hunters and mercenaries may again be employed to hunt down the most dangerous or problematic of these groups. Sometimes colonists from hive worlds will be sent to repopulate war planets that have been stabilised, willing or not, allowing their repopulation and hopeful redevelopment. A challenging task for planets that have often been thoroughly reaped by decades of war and with little if any remaining infrastructure or ecosystem, often as well littered with the dead and sad destroyed ruins of previous habitation. As with anything in the Imperium though, the grinding bureaucracy keeps everything in perfect slow motion. It could be years, even centuries, before a successfully held world begins the process of repopulation. The Sabbat worlds are an example of the edge of Imperial control, as the Imperium would attempt to wrest control of them from the forces of chaos, notably the blood god Khorne. The Sabbat sector is named after a young girl who reportedly received a vision from the Emperor and who subsequently would lead a crusade to bring the region into the Imperium. That initial crusade began in Millennium 35, lasting around about a century. But by the 37th millennium, mankind was well established throughout the Sabbat sector. Due to its proximity though, to dangerous border incursions, it was continually contested with Xenos and Chaos threats. This would lead to it soon being designated troublesome by the Imperial Administratum. These small incursions would merely be the beginning of its problems though. During the 41st millennium, some initial assaults which were thought to be normal Chaos incursions quickly deteriorated into an attempt by Chaos to take control of the entire sector. The Imperium hadn't intended to lose this area, but were quickly overwhelmed by the size of the attacking forces. Chaos would take full control of the area eventually, and this area would then be reclassified as Hazardous in the year 741 of Millennium 41. The centre of Imperial control in the region was forced to evacuate and the whole region lost to the dark forces of chaos. An ongoing crusade of war persists to the current day to free the Sabbat sector from the chaos darkness that has enveloped it. Disturbingly high losses have been noted by the Imperium attempting to liberate this region. Now the Imperium of Man will undoubtedly be ultimately victorious given its already heavy commitment of forces to the Sabbat campaign. The only question is what will be the cost to retain this sector now having been in a state of war for roughly 3,000 years. Fortress worlds are planets in the Imperium that are bastions. They are heavily defended with vast numbers of Imperial Guard and Navy assets at their disposal. Their sole focus is defensive, and they are actually uncommon in the scheme of planets across the Imperium. All inhabitants on a fortress world will be committed strictly to military levels of discipline, and the whole place will be run to machine levels of efficiency and order. All citizens there will function with the timing and strictness of a military unit. The cities located here are vast bunkers with thick defensive walls punctuated with artillery and ground-to-orbit firing systems. 
Their industry obviously is nearly entirely focused on the production of munitions and related materials. Conscription here for PDF or Planetary Defense Force is usually permanently enacted. Many Imperial Guard families on fortress planets boast proud and documented histories of their entire families being in service from near cradle to grave with no exceptional break. Imperial soldiers from fortress worlds are well studied in tactical doctrines and some of the most well trained in the Imperium. Often they are specialised in countering the forces the fortress was established to defend against and they are some of the most fiercely loyal in the Imperial Guard and much less likely to break in combat, unlike say recruits forced into service from hive worlds. Fortress soldiers also have a strong regard for integrity and duty. The firepower from a fortress world is often extreme in its power and range. The fortress world of Morlond, once captured by Chaos, the Imperium would feel the other side of these powerful bastions. Morlond featured powerful long-range weapons that could lay waste to worlds already reclaimed by the Imperial Crusade in the Sabbat region. But then comes Cadia, one of if not the most famous of fortress worlds. Once an Earth-like planet with a variety of biomes and established healthy ecosystems, it unfortunately stood as one of the only Imperial planets that stood at the passage of the Cadian Gate. That is the passage to the rift in the warp known as the Eye of Terror. The Eye of Terror is the gateway for Chaos to enter into the material universe, and the proximity of Cadia required the population there to heavily fortify their planet or face complete destruction of their world and it would become the first target of the Warmaster Abaddon, one of the most favoured champions of Horus Lupercal during their traitorous campaign against the Imperium during the period of heresy. Abaddon would launch heavy assaults every few centuries from the Eye of Terror, with Cadia square in the path, hoping to reignite his heretical campaign that they had once attempted and failed to claim victory from. Having been lost to chaos during the heresy, Cadia was resettled by loyalist colonists in the 32nd millennium. But they would discover the planet contained strange dark pylons that would dot its landscape. These would later be revealed as Necron constructs to hold back the psychic energies of the Eye of Terror and was an ancient Necron base during their war with the Old Ones. The fortification of Cadia meant the near entire population lives in fortress cities known as the Kassar, leaving Cadia with an odd landscape of vast urban fortresses and unspoilt natural environment. This apparent stability though would not last. In the 13th Crusade by Abaddon in the year 999 of Millennium 41, Mechanicus Archmagus Belisarius Call would ally with the Necron Lord Trazen the Infinite to attempt to defeat their shared enemy of the suppurating Chaos forces from the Eye of Terror. This alliance of Mechanicus and Necron would attempt to close the Eye of Terror with the Necron pylons on Cadia. Abaddon though, blindly enraged and frustrated by the defiance of the humans on Cadia, would send to destroy them a Blackstone Fortress. And a Blackstone Fortress is a giant alien constructed star fortress first used by the war between the Old Ones and Necrons during the War in Heaven. But these craft would be subsequently used by the Imperium and Chaos. They were awoken during one of Abaddon's campaigns and then appropriated. So Abaddon would send the fortress crashing into the planet like some kind of catastrophic artificial meteor strike. The immense energy released from impact wiped out the bulk of Cadia's defenders and destroyed the network of Cadian pylons as well as severely damaging the planet's structural integrity. Millions of citizens were evacuated but the planet's loss was immeasurable. The fall of Cadia was a significant victory for the forces of chaos leading to the formation of the Great Rift, a huge tear in space emanating from the Eye of Terror. The few survivors from Cadia formed a fragment of Imperial heroes escaping destruction of the Cadia Fortress world. They would escape with the help of a new faction of Eldar known as the Inari. Using the Eldar webway they would form the Celestian Crusade and in this alliance lead to a new hope for humanity with the resurrection of the Ultramarines chapter Primarch, Robo Gulliman.
Now as we continue on with the lore guys, there's plenty here to get into. I would love to flesh out some of this a little bit more, but if you enjoyed this so far, drop me a little like. I plan to continue on with the next Planets of the Imperium where I'll be covering the Death Worlds.